like this picture. It's a view from outer space that locates Pacific people's home in this global world. That blue space is our beacon, our home. The Pacific Ocean is the single largest geographical feature. It covers almost roughly half of the world's ocean surface and almost a third of the Earth's surface. Its significance to life cannot be overstated. It is life-giving. Indigenous peoples the world over have always understood life and seek to live within the boundaries of the environment, respecting it. We as Pacific people, this ocean is our life. It's our lifeline. It's our mana, our mori. It is where we go to be inspired. We can trace our genealogy and our histories through the ocean. It holds the future in this great ocean. Yet despite the fact that it is life-giving, we as human beings continue to disrespect it. Our home today is under real and serious threats, man-made activities such as overfishing, pollution, destru destruction of habitats, Seabed mining is a new threat. But the most significant threat for Pacific Islanders is climate change and the resulting sea level rise. Who amongst us will stand to be the guardians of this great ocean, our home, our life? Professor Epeli Haofa, one of our leading Pacific thinkers and writers, in his paper, Our Sea of Islands, writes that we, the people of the Pacific, are its greatest custodians. That the task before us to wisely manage, use, and protect these resources is not a small thing. It is a contribution of magnitude to humanity as a whole a noble and a worthy cause. Many of us today are very lucky to have homes and families, our homes that we share with. We would not go into someone else's home and tell them how to live their lives. Why would we then allow someone to come into our home and tell us how to live in our life, in our homes? Do not misunderstand me or misrepresent me. This is not an anti-Western diatribe, nor is it a thinly veiled racist rant. The challenge for Pacific Islanders is that if we are not careful about how foreign interests sets and who sets our agenda, we will be in a place where we don't recognize and we would fail not only our children, our ancestors, but our planet as a whole. Where do we start? How do you start on this noble and worthy course? In the words of a Carib the Caribbean political commentator, Marcus Garvey, Made famous by Bob Marley, we start by freeing our minds. We start by emancipating ourselves from mental slavery. It's not a small task, but it's a noble and worthy task. For many of you today, this is the big idea that we Pacific Islanders are self determining. We are setting the rules about how to govern how to be the custodians of our ocean home. But is it the big idea? For me, it feels like a 
logical part of our story, our collective stories. And I want to share you just a few parts of my story of how I've come to be here. The year was 2008, I think it was May 2008. I was in Madang, a coastal uh, town uh, in Papua New Guinea. I was my first day on the job, and I was part of a Pacific Civil Society delegation to present our views regarding concerns on a free trade agreement that was negotiated between the European Union, Africa, Caribbean, and Pacific partners. And in true Pacific style, we start with formalities. So I started by thanking the government of Papua New Guinea, the people of Papua New Guinea for hosting us. Uh, the European Commission for generously supporting and financing our trip over. And as I was just getting into starting to present concerns, the head of the European Commission delegation, the French ambassador at that time, started to disrupt, shout, interrupt, that what concerns could we as specific people have? This trade deal is Europe doing us a favor. I remember being humiliated, very angry, and it was one of those rare times where I broke down publicly and cried. We broke very quickly for tea, because you know tea kind of sorts out everything. Um, and this really amazing negotiator from the Pacific, he came to ask if I was okay, and he gave me some advice that I remember to this day. He said to me that I would have to quickly grow a thick skin if I was to survive economics and trade negotiations. Remember, I come from environment. He considered environment negotiations kindergarten stuff. But he also told me that in trade negotiations, I would be exposed to one of humanity's flaws, a trait, greed, pure greed, to access resources that is bountiful here in the Pacific for our major partners. He taught me that trade agreements are very rarely about Pacific development interests, despite all the rhetorics. I went back in, completed my statement, and started to grow a thick skin. What happened to me in Madang is, wasn't unusual. In fact, in November of 2006, 7, um, our Pacific leaders were treated and humiliated on the global scene. Uh, the lead negotiator at the time for the European Commission was Lord Peter Mendelssohn, dubbed the Dark Lord of negotiations. Not only did he interrupt Pacific protocols, niceties, he held up an atlas upside down and demanded to know where Papua New Guinea was on that map. He went further to instruct that the Pacific lose its lead negotiator. I was reminded again by this perception of us, how the world views us as specific people in 2013. Um, I was going with a good friend of mine, a wonderful activist from Papua New Guinea by the name of Rosa Koyan, taking a very difficult campaign message which says, ban seabed mining. I learned that the European Union has white papers that are very, very instrumental about what they want. It was very clear that European Union wanted unhindered access to resources, raw materials, minerals in particular, which lies on the bottom of our ocean floor. These minerals and raw materials are the lifeline of the European Union. It is worth 30 million European jobs for strategic areas such as construction, aviation, aeronautics, research, development, 
technology development, it's worth 1,300 something billion dollars to the European Union. When we brought up this very small matter that the European Union was funding a project here in the Pacific that was facilitating legislations for exploitations to take place, dismissed again. Europe's doing us a favor, giving us legislation to allow the exploitation of these minerals that sits on our seafloor. By the way, these are exploitations that are not, are not allowed in European waters, but it's okay to test the technology here in the Pacific. This is a challenge for Pacific Islanders. How do we respond to greed, pure greed, to a global proposition that we are nothing more than locations for raw materials, places to test technology for the advancement of the northern countries? that our purpose is to advance someone else's economic positioning. Before I come to what is, what is a Pacific considered response, I want to just share with you a little bit part, going back a little bit, of a story, of my story. This time the year is 1997. I've just come out of university from Australia. Um, and I was looking for a job. Um, I tried government, I didn't last, uh, but I was very fortunate to get on to the Rainbow Warrior as a deckhand. And that experience is, was my very first experience with this ocean. We traveled from the north all the way south and it's for the first time I appreciated its vastness, its sheer beauty, its power, and its amazing creatures. I learned something very personal about myself. I learned that I am no voyager. <laughs> that all these wonderful things we talk about our ancestors being, being great navigators, well, guess what? Those genes skipped me. The moment the Rainbow Warrior sails through the reef into open ocean water, I was throwing up on the side. Um, and there was, I, it got so bad that I was on IV with threats to ever lift me from Tuvalu back to Fiji. But I learned something much, much more significant. I learned that this great ocean has a painful history, a history that's not taught in schools or universities. The history that I learned in the Marshalls was that the United States tested not one, not 10, but 67 nuclear weapons. I learned that women gave birth to jelly babies which the US has refused to give back because they remain test subjects. I learned that our people were encouraged, including US Navy personnel, to look at that mushroom and be in awe. Presumably, the global view is that this vast ocean, with very little people or no people at all, could absorb the power of these weapons. I want to just situate what it means to have 67 weapons tested. If you were to equally parcel them over 12 years, they're equivalent to 1.6 Hiroshima bombs per day over 12 years. This is not a history taught in school. Micro, the smallest amongst us, Niger, I found that on these small islands live some of the most courageous, amazing people defending our ocean. These are people who draw a line that simply says no more. We will not be victims. Today, Micronesia teaches us 
that they act by standing up, not just only to big polluters, to the US military, but they set the terms of who comes to fish and how to conserve fisheries for generations to come. They stand with and for the people of West Papua. It struck me in 2008 that as Pacific Islanders, if we were operating within the frame set by outside interest, that we would consistently struggle to win. And so began my search for knowledge. I went first to our knowledge bank, the libraries, I went back into history culture, tradition. And in those papers written by Epeli Haofa, I found that his writings resonate, that they spoke to me, but I just didn't know how to take that and bring them into life, to practice it. And yet, when I looked right across the Pacific, I saw people who were doing that, who were practicing self-determination. So I began to look for these practitioners People who, in my view, are born, whose genetic codes are, is hardwired to this ancient truth about who we are as specific people. And in my search, I was amazed because I found them everywhere from all walks of life. They are ordinary people. People that sit beside you on a bus, village women, men, old, young, some academics, some are much more super global, branding if you like, but they are everywhere. I see them. I see me in them. And they give hope because they are our frontline defenders, our guardians of this ocean. They hold up half the sky. The challenge for Pacific Islanders is being able to see them. These people that exist, who holds knowledge and wisdom in them. But it was in my journey that I was reconnected with Dr. Teresia Tewa. Um, and she became quite important in my life because she is not only an educator, she practices through her poetry, her writing, fiercely dedicated to a Pacific intellectual response to complex global issues that we are faced with. It was she who taught me that as Pacific Islanders, including those that have come to make this their home, we are privileged. We are privileged because our ancestors traveled this great ocean wisely using its resources and they gifted it to us to protect and to look after. But it was she who taught me that um, you had to defend this place from a place of love despite the painful histories, the injustices caused to our people and the environment. There was no place for anger, for ego, for self-righteousness. You have to defend it, defend it from the place of love. And she did it fiercely with her mind, her heart, and her soul. And so I remember I used to go to her and just say, oh my goodness, I'm going to present to a group of scientists, economists, policymakers, techie people, some of the brightest in the world. How do I convince them to link their minds with their hearts? She gave me knowledge. She gave me words. But it was my sister, Maria Penjueli, who taught me responsibility to family and to home. Sacrifice of one's own interest for this greater good. These two women 
are our defenders, our custodians of this great ocean, and they've left us too soon. This TED talk is a dedication to the two of them. They left us at a critical time. In June this year, world leaders will gather in New York to determine the fate of our ocean home. Now, I know there are many skeptics amongst us, homegrown and over the seas, about UN systems, governments, government intentions. But this is an, a chance for us to come together, to look at this great ocean home of ours. Our leaders, in my view, are taking a noble and worthy cause. They will take difficult issues to New York that not only challenges current uh, threats to our life and livelihoods, but they will bring up historical issues such as the nuclear contamination issue. They will challenge the international community to recognize explicitly the boundaries of the islands that are likely to go under as a result of climate change. They will call for a reset of global ocean governance, which will seek to constrain the economic pillar so that the environment, social pillars will thrive. For me, I think the biggest challenge is how do we, as specific people, leverage this wealth of knowledge that already exists, these experiences that speak to solutions? How do we give them explicit rights as the custodians of this great ocean? How do we give the ocean itself a right? Because it is life and life-giving. So I leave you with a challenge. I know where I stand today. Do you? Are you ready to give up being victims, to grow thick skins? Defend this place from a place of love. Because the ocean needs its custodians, its guardians. Do you know where you stand today? Thank you.